it's one of those topics that we've been talking about these two for 50 plus years, right? And trying to get rid of them or, or reduce disease because of them. Yet we really haven't made a lot of progress. And part of the reason for that is uh, because as most of the listeners probably know, um, you you can work really hard to get rid of one strain or one subtype of either of these species. And as soon as you do that, another one's going to look at that that niche that's been opened and and come right in and have a lot of success there. Welcome to the Poultry Podcast Show. Um, I'm Dr. Liz Bovek, and today I'm here with Dr. Tim Johnson, and we are going to have a, a chat about his area of expertise. Welcome to the show. Hi, Liz. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm very excited to hear uh, about your research area today. It's timely and always relevant when we're talking about uh, bacteria and pathogens in poultry. So can you first tell me how did you get into poultry? Yeah, I, I, I'd say my story, I don't know if it's unique, but it's definitely interesting. So I I went up to, after high school, I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, went up to North Dakota State University in Fargo and spent uh, about six years up there, but started out as pre-med. Learned really quickly that that was not at all interesting to me. So then I shifted to, I took a class in I think it was my second or third year that was uh, pathogenic microbiology uh, from Dr. Lisa Nolan. And and she's now the dean at the University of Georgia in the vet school there. But uh, I just fell in love with this idea of pathogenic bacteria. And so then I actually shifted towards uh, clinical lab sciences or the old, it used to be referred to as medical technology, which is kind of the lab component of healthcare, right? And so then I started down that road and and realized that it was kind of for me it was a little bit of a dead end because it was really it's really focused on running tests and machines right and less about being creative and so um, got to got to my senior year in college and still had no clue what I was going to do uh, ended up with a microbiology degree though and so somebody had suggested maybe you should consider graduate school so I I. Came back the next fall after I got accepted into grad school at NDSU, and I went walked in the door on the first day of grad school with again no clue where I was going to go or what I was going to do. But I, as they they said, go around and visit the different labs and see what people do. And and this was a a department where it's it's not poultry focused at all, right? It's it's a little bit of everything microbiology. So. I just happened to walk in last to Dr. Lisa Nolan's lab, and she started talking about this this idea of of E. coli in chickens and turkeys, and and I had never even heard about E. coli in chickens and turkeys before. So I was fascinated by that, and and from kind of day one, I I just really embraced the idea of being able to to do research that can actually have an impact on farmers and people and, and the animals themselves. And that that's always kind of been the part of of being on the animal egg side that I like is that you can do things that will have more of an immediate impact. Oh yeah. Yeah. So how uh, how did you um come to your current position? Yeah. Um so I after grad school I went to Iowa State. I stayed with Dr. Nolan and and did a postdoc down there uh, working and that was really a door opener for me at Iowa State because I got to spend three years in Ames at a different place, uh, meet a lot of people in the vet school there. But probably more importantly, it opened up the world of genomics and bioinformatics to me that at, at the time, places like NDSU just didn't have those resources yet um, because it was fairly new, this idea of next-gen sequencing and all that. Um, that is really what kind of, I'd say that cemented and paved the direction of my career more than anything was, was the, those experiences. So after uh, just over two years of a postdoc, I applied uh, at a variety of colleges. And one of them that I was very hopeful of was University of Minnesota because I grew up in Minnesota and would love to come home. And uh, it's a long story, but eventually I got that job. <laughs> and uh, with a lot of uh, 
unknowns there, but but I got the position and came in there in 2007 in, in the Twin Cities and started there in St. Paul. And I've been at the university ever since, although my my home and where I, where I live has changed a little bit. Um, and we can talk about that uh, later. But uh, but yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed um, just being a part of the faculty in, in this type of environment at the at a veterinary college. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So can you can you tell us a little bit about what you work on um, as far as uh, pathogenic and other sorts of bacteria and poultry? Yeah. Um, so it's it's shifted over time. And that's that's the other interesting thing is that you come out of grad school and they encourage you to do things that are different from your your PhD or your postdoc advisor. Right. And so uh, Lisa Nolan is a, an E. coli expert. So initially I, I went away from E. coli for quite a while and um, got interested in the plasmids that, that uh, bacteria carry, uh, still with a, a focus on, on poultry and, and antimicrobial resistance, uh, but spent a lot of time for the first few years studying the mechanisms and the ways that these plasmids can move around and spread, right, and how that can impact AMR in not only animal production, but also in human health. Um, and from there, though, I, I got interested in the microbiome for uh, for quite a while. And that was right around the time where microbiome was just starting to emerge, was around you know, 2008, 2009. And not that the concept had been around forever, but the technology had made it so that everybody could do it, right? And, and so... Uh, one of the first trials we did uh, on microbiome was looking at broiler chickens and asking the question, if you feed them just a standard diet versus feeding them a, a, a low dose or an antibiotic growth promoter concentration in the feed uh, and an anticoccidial with or without an anticoccidial, what impact does that have on the microbiome? And and we, we were able to find that... Um, I, found, I learned two things about the microbiome from that. One was that you can find changes with just about anything you apply, <laughs> like whether it's in feed or changes in diet uh, or like feed additives. Uh, there's always a shift, right? Um, but the other thing I learned is it's a great, well, it's a, a lot of people consider it a fishing expedition. It's also a, a great hypothesis generator. And so from that that study and some Studies after that, we we learned about these particular lactobacilli that always seem to correlate with positively correlate with uh, the performance of the bird. And so we got really interested for a while in studying that species of, of lactobacillus called Lactobacillus johnsonii. And uh, that's not related to my name. I didn't name the bacteria, but uh, I was going to ask if you you got to name it. I could ask that question more than you would imagine, but no, we didn't. And ironically, the, the student that's working on the project right now, her name is Abby Johnson, too. So so she gets the same question, and she's not related to me, and we're not related to whoever discovered or got the bacteria named after them. But uh, but anyway, so so we went down the road of, of further studying that bacteria, and, and we're in, in the process of trying to get that commercialized as a, as a poultry probiotic. So I think that was a really fun time for me. It was just learning about the microbiome and what it can do, but also seeing the potential to apply it and, and come out the back end with, with uh, solutions, right? And that went on for probably five or six years, I would say. And then, then I started to shift back towards the bacteria that I love the most, which are E. coli and Salmonella. <laughs> and so, so slowly but surely I've been transitioning and actually most of our projects that we're doing right now are focused on avian pathogenic E. coli in both chickens and turkeys and also layers, uh, but also um, trying to, to better understand Salmonella, especially with the potential changes in, in regulatory practices that may be coming. I think there's really just this great need for for producers to have, have to empower them to to use the same tools that that people like the CDC are using and and but use them in a in a way to have proactive and positive impact on their farms. Yeah. So what 
Uh, what is your favorite thing about salmonella and E. coli? Is it, you know, that they can move around quite quick or they don't, it doesn't take much to cause a problem? <laughs> I, I think it's, it's multifold, but one, one big thing is that I, I really, I enjoy and hate at the same time how quickly they are able to evolve and change, right? And, I mean, it's just, it's, it's one of those topics that we've been talking about these two for 50 plus years, right? And trying to get rid of them or, or reduce disease because of them, yet we really haven't made a lot of progress. And part of the reason for that is uh, because as most of the listeners probably know, um, you you can work really hard to get rid of one strain or one subtype of either of these species. And as soon as you do that, another one's going to look at that that niche that's been opened and and come right in and have a lot of success there. And there's and historically that's been the case over and over again. And we've we've been able to see it uh, in the literature and and everything else. But so that's one piece is just it, it's fun to because you can you can watch evolution in real time. Even though even though viruses evolve faster, bacteria in my way can I think can evolve more impactfully in the short term sometimes. And and so so that's really interesting and fascinating to me. Um, the other thing, and I'll just be honest about E. coli and salmonella is that they're really easy to work with, and that is uh, that's a plus, right? Because one of the other things we've tried to learn more about um, just just culturing them as a challenge, right? And 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 because most of my stuff is is focusing on on high resolution genomics to ask questions. It's really important to be able to get a lot of isolates and a lot of samples uh, to work with. And when you get a case of, I know I can get E. coli from almost every sample, and I know I can get salmonella re reliably from 20% of samples, that's really easy to deal with as opposed to it might take me weeks to get and or grow this particular bacterium, right? So, so and, I, and in part, I think that's why you see that when you look at genomics and how many genomes are out there, there's there's a very good correlation with how easy they are to recover as well, too. Yes. Yeah. So for the people um, that are listening that might be a little bit less familiar with uh, Salmonella and E. coli, um, can you describe maybe a, a, just a few key features, like, you know, Probably importantly, why why are they commensal in poultry? I mean, yeah. They're a food foodborne pathogen for us, but for birds, like you said, if one leaves, another one can fill that niche. So I'll start with salmonella, and I mean everybody has heard about salmonella, I believe, <laughs> you and nobody wants to ever encounter it, right? But, uh, <laughs> you but it's it's such an interesting bug because. Uh, like like you mentioned, it's it lives in the gut um, a lot. A, they they do very well in the cica of the bird, and they they really they can they're invasive in the sense that they can become systemic, right? So they'll they it's a fecal oral route of transmission. It's traditionally what we think happens, and they they're very easily spread, and and uh, that's that's one problem. But the other is that they can invade and become systemic without causing in a, any apparent signs of disease in the bird um, because they've, they've adapted to a commensal lifestyle in these hosts. They do, they, you know, everything evolves for a reason. And sometimes things evolve to become more pathogenic and towards like a dead end host. And usually that the case there is that they know that that dead end host is going to die. And then it's, going to release itself and spread all over the place, right? But in the case of poultry, they've kind of gone the reverse direction, which is they've adapted to become very, very commensal-like in the way that they, they live in the host. And and so how does that connect to, to humans then? It, it, it connects multiple ways. One is uh, the one that I'm actually a little more concerned about as of recently is the live contact with birds. Um, so, so we we've looked at uh chick papers and chick pads and things like that from not only commercial sources but also 
the sources that feed like the farm stores um, that sold to to um, small flock or backyard poultry producers. And and the the recovery of salmonella on those is very high. It's it's uh, we're seeing around seventy five to eighty uh, percent, which is much higher than what you would see commercially, right? And so that's a concern because it it really you know, when you think about a foodborne transmission of salmonella, there's a lot of things that have to go wrong for you to ultimately ingest that and get sick. But with contact with backyard birds, it doesn't take much for something to go wrong because you've got birds in an open environment. You're feeding them daily, uh, giving them water. A lot of times your kids are doing it, right? And as we know, kids are not always, either. even if they're aware, they're not always fully taking it seriously in terms of the risk that you pose, right? So that, and, and then of course, you've got the fact that they're in your yard and, and things can spread in the environment as well, right? So so that to me is is a major route that, that we've probably underlooked in the past that's going to become more of a problem as, as we get more and more backyard poultry production. Um, but then of course, there's the foodborne route, which, uh, this, you know, there's a lot of practices in place to, to along the processing line to cut down and reduce and hopefully eliminate salmonella. But it's still because of the fact that these things are in the gut, but they can also become systemic. Um, even if you can truly avoid gut uh, or fecal contamination of the carcass, there's still that possibility that as these as birds get deboned and, and all these different processes that you can contaminate along the, the line. Uh, and then, of course, the ground product is the biggest issue because you can really that then you're putting together many, many different birds and grinding it up. Right. And and that all it takes then is a one super shedder to have enough contamination to make a lot of people sick. Um, uh, e. coli is a little bit different, right, because when when most people think of E. coli, they think of 0157H7 or the things that we hear about in the news uh, for it started with Jack in the Box, or you know, many years ago in hamburgers, but now it's uh, it's more common in produce uh, like romaine lettuce, spinach, uh, sprouts, all of those things, and that's not the kind of E. coli that is a problem in in poultry. In fact, we find very little, if any, of those types of strains in poultry. The ones that we do see are highly adapted towards not not living as a commensal in those birds, but living both as a commensal and also killing those birds. Uh, so so they've, they've got this unique set of genes that they've acquired, and, and it's, it's many, many different strains, hundreds to thousands of different strains, but they, they all have these, these genes on, on a plasmid that make them better at not only colonizing the bird, but also persisting in in the trachea of the bird and then ultimately crossing over into the bloodstream of the bird. And so some people might ask, how does E. coli get from the gut into the trachea, right? Um, but when, when you think about it, it really makes sense, right? This is the, And this is what's interesting to me about e, this particular E. coli, which we call avian pathogenic E. coli. But this, this E. coli is the only type that I know of that is able to cause disease primarily through a respiratory route. All, all the other diseases that you see in humans and other animals, it either goes through the gut or it goes through the urinary tract or it goes through maybe skin infections or wounds, right? But this one can primarily start in the respiratory tract. And, and the main reason for that is the set of genes it's got that allow it to colonize in the in the respiratory tract really efficiently but also just the nature of of uh, commercial poultry production in the sense that we're trying to keep the environment uh, somewhat dry not too wet right as a result of that you've got all these birds moving around they're kicking up dust and that dust has a lot of fecal contamination in it so they're constantly exposed through the respiratory tract to to sources of e coli and and what's interesting about the E. coli in, in birds is that um, you could take 10 birds and continually expose them to one of these strains, and probably nine out of 10 of those birds 
would be unaffected by it, or at least at face value, unaffected by it. So in a sense, when they're healthy, they're, they're very good at, at dealing with that constant exposure, right? They've evolved for that. But throw in any type of stressor. And so it could be something as simple as a vaccination schedule or maybe a little bit of heat stress or ammonia or whatever, anything that will just bring down the immune system a little bit. That's when you start to see these particular strains are the, are really good at, as soon as that immune system is suppressed just a little bit, they take advantage of that. And they they get into the trachea and then they're able to, to cause damage, uh, colonize the air sacs, cross over and, and get into the systemic organs. Um, but I should say that not all E. coli that, that are in a barn are capable of doing this. And in fact, the, you still have your traditional gut E. coli, which are a little bit different from these, these avian pathogenic E. coli. They sometimes will have some of these genes, but not all of them. Sometimes they will be a slightly different uh, genomic background. So they come from a different lineage, basically. And, and those, those bacteria are the ones that actually dominate in the gut. So you would expect to see those also dominating in disease, but in fact, they're very rare in disease. Maybe uh, 10% of the of clinical cases you see might be due to one of those E. coli. And, it, and it's the flip for these pathogenic ones. You've, you don't see them very often in the gut, like very low prevalence in the gut, but 90% of the infections that cause death of the bird are caused by that subset. So it's kind of this inverse correlation, which is, it, it doesn't make sense, but but uh, it does when you consider the the traits that they carry and how they're they're so good at doing that. Yeah, yeah. So um, so what are you what are you currently working on that maybe is translational to help the producer or help industry maybe better control or understand these different pathogens? So so sticking with E. coli, one one of the things that we're working on right now that's uh, funding from USDA is to, you know, for a long time, I, I've looked at clinical isolates versus gut. And gut isolates would be defined as anything that comes from anywhere in the gut, right? And so we've, we've done that for many years and, and said, okay, there's these differences between the clinical ones and the, and the gut isolates. But we started to realize a few years ago that uh, we did a study where rather than collecting like fecal droppings or just environmental E. coli or or even ileum E. coli from a healthy bird, we were collecting cecal E. coli from healthy birds. And pretty quickly we realized that these cecal, cecal E. coli actually look a lot more like the pathogenic population than the, than the ones we've been collecting from other areas of the gut. And so that got me interested in just what is the ecology of E. coli as you go from top to bottom in the gut, as you go in, in the respiratory tract of healthy birds, and then compare that to, to the ones that are causing disease. So we've been studying that now for a few years. And then we coupled on that, this idea of what about when we do things to mitigate? So for example, we apply a, uh, a live attenuated E. coli vaccine, or we use a, uh, a postbiotic or a probiotic, does that, we, we have, we've, people have looked before at what does that do to the levels of generic E. coli, so the total E. coli, but they haven't really looked at what does that do to the specific populations of E. coli in these different places. And so it's it's been really fascinating though, because what we're seeing is that, for example, if you use uh, the live attenuated commercial vaccine that's available for E. coli, it it will, in a very short time frame, and I'm talking one flock cycle in turkeys, but even within the flock cycle, like less than a month, you see that the populations of, of bacteria that are most closely related to that vaccine strain that was developed, they start to disappear from the gut. And, and what you see is that m many of these other populations come in. And so in a sense, that's encouraging, right? Because the vaccine is is having an effect at the gut level, and it's shifting those populations away from what what the vaccine was designed for. the The one problem with E. coli in birds, though, is that 
it's not just one strain that's the problem. It's it's actually dozens of strains that make up the dominant clinical ones. And and, and if you looked at them on on a tree of life and compared them to one another, they're some of them are very far apart, like not even, I mean, they're all the same species, but with any coli, there's so much diversity, right? So it's really unlikely that a vaccine strain would protect against all of them. It'll protect against some of the most closely related ones, but not all of them. And, and so what we've seen is that even though there's this shift, when you apply the vaccine, um, some of the groups that, that start to enrich because of that are actually other pathogenic clones of bacteria that that can cause disease in the bird. So in a sense, the vaccine is doing what it was designed to do. But I think just the nature of diversity in E. coli makes it really challenging to control against all of them. Gosh, yeah, the the other strains are happy that they had a chance. they've, They've just got better. They're more competitive, right? So yeah, gosh, exactly what you don't want. But I mean, what 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 could you do? Do you create more vaccines or do you change something else about the environment? Like what's, what do you think is yeah. next? <laughs> well, I think part of, part of what we're doing too is trying to take those dozen or so that are the most problematic ones based on how often they cause disease. And in, in the lab, we've been working with some companies to, to just look at uh, this. So we've got this library of strains and uh, if we start applying different, mitigation strategies against it in a test tube, do we see differences from strain to strain, right? So for example, if I if I take a, 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 a MOS product or a postbiotic product or something along those lines and take and put it, just compete it in a tube or put it in a tube along with those 12 strains, do we see the reduction that we would expect across the board or do we see more strain specific reductions? And I think the most surprising thing from that so far has been I had thought that it would be a generic across the board reduction for pretty much most of the products that are out there. But what we're seeing is that it's quite the opposite, that there there is uh, some very strain specific effects that these, because the, when you think about these products, they're, the way that they work in general is, is very generalized. Like so, so, for example, a Moss product is going to bind to the fimbriae in, in salmonella and E. coli and inactivated. So you would think that that should be kind of the same case with any strain that you put in there. But that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing that it does de- it is very strain dependent. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Which again, I think, yeah, if you come back to, well, what, what can we do with this? I think it helps us to understand, like, if, if this particular farm has this set of strains and, and we know that product A is effective against them, um, rather than having to to blindly pick which which product should I use, you can it can guide your choice a little bit more. Or if I'm going to do autogenous vaccination for E. coli, um, number one, should I be doing that? Is it better to use a commercial vaccine, or should I go the route of autogenous? And if I go the route of autogenous, how do I pick the best strain? I think you know there's been a lot of different ways of doing it. I, I like now that many of the vaccine companies are using whole genome sequences to try to guide their customers towards picking strains. But I think there's a lot that we can do there to help not only guide them, but also start to gain knowledge on if uh, if if I see strain A, B, and C, um, maybe I have a vaccine against strain B, will it actually work against strain C, right? Um, having some understanding of not only the, the protection against that particular strain, but what types of cross protection might exist. I think that's going to be useful too. Yeah. So is uh, is the story the same for control or reduction of salmonella or is it a little different? Yeah, it's a little different. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, on the salmonella side, um, we've really been, this started back during the, the salmonella redding outbreak in Turkey is back, I think it was 2017. And that was, really the first time that I had been able to work hands-on during an outbreak using genomics. And uh, it was fun because we got to go in and pull out every salmonella redding genome that's in existence and compare it with some field strains that were collected here in Minnesota. And then, of course, compare it to the current outbreak strains. And, And we learned a lot about this particular serotype and how 
uh, a new strain had essentially emerged out of nowhere, which prior to the outbreak, Reading was considered more of a non-problem in, in poultry, meaning they saw it a lot in turkey production. They, On the human side, you rarely saw disease with it. So it's almost like salmonella Kentucky in chickens, which is the same story where we, we don't worry as much about it, even though it doesn't help that that when the standards they've got right now for looking for salmonella it wouldn't matter what it is, right? If it's salmonella, it's, it's it's all bad. But the companies looked at it like, I'd rather have Redding than Heidelberg or Hadar or Typhimerium, right? But that all changed when this, this strain, essentially it acquired two mutations, so two small changes to it. One was picking up a new virulence gene, and the other was modifying uh, a receptor that that basically makes it more resistant to killing from other bacteria, so more competitive in the gut. So it was a combination, we think, of these two changes that made this new strain more of a problem in humans. It made them sick, but also much more persistent in turkeys. And so that whole story just got me thinking, like, what if we could do this on a broader scale and do it in a way where we're looking at these genomes prior to an outbreak as opposed to during or after an outbreak. And maybe if, if we do it in the right way, we can use genomics plus some phenotypic information to, to, to throw up red flags when, a, when a, a new or bad strain appears in production. And so that's essentially what we're working on right now is, is we, we're pulling in more than 500,000 different salmonella genomes and basically looking at them serotype by serotype and trying to understand within a serotype what the the structure of uh, those different strains looks like. Like, are there different clades and, and are there emergent or new clades that are, that are popping up in poultry production? But then also to do a cross serotype comparison to, to understand... Um, not only how their genomes compare to each other, but also if we put them into animal models or put them into test tube models, what's the propensity of these different serotypes to persist in birds, number one, but also to ultimately cause human disease. So, so all that's going on simultaneously, and we're using that to develop this computational tool where it would be more automated, where you know new genomes from FSIS and CDC would come in on a regular basis, and, and hopefully, our goal is that you, that poultry producers would latch onto this, and that they would want to submit their own internal salmonella for for surveillance as well. And then those this this machine learning would be used then to flag um, when an, when an emergent strain that that could be problematic arises, and that that it could be dealt with. Because if, if you think about the Reading story, uh, they they knew about it, that it was increasing just before the outbreak, although they didn't know it was going to be a human health problem. Um, obviously, the outbreak occurred, and then they rapidly Im implemented the vaccination strategies and different mitigation procedures, but it took them a year and a half to, to eliminate the problem, right? And so and th that strain is still out there. And so it, it takes time to, to have an effect because a lot of times you're doing it at the breeder level, right? And to have that that downstream effect, it just takes a long time. Um, so our goal would be, well, if you can find these emergent strains early enough and know that they're going to be a problem, you can start to deal with them early enough that hopefully by the time your your mitigation starts to have impact, there won't be that that surge of of human illnesses that would occur on the back end. Yeah. So what's the relative importance of the species that you're working in? So there's different genetics and lifespan. Are, do you apply these different control methods the same across all species? Or do you have the opportunity to use maybe different based on, you know, the laying hen that might go to 110 weeks versus a turkey that's in the, you know, 18 to 22 versus a broiler that might be, you know, five to seven? It seems like their the relative importance might be different. Yeah, I think it most certainly is. I mean, E. coli and salmonella are a problem in all three, right? But yeah. they're very different problems in all three. And you actually see 
with E. coli, you know, like in a broiler, you're going to see peak disease very early in, in broiler production, right? So the first couple of weeks is when you see that that problem. In, in turkeys, in contrast, you see a little bit of problem early, but then you see more of a problem uh, after they get moved from brood to grow out facilities, right? And then they get stressed and they're they're more susceptible at that time to, to infection. Then you look at a laying hen and that seems to be very farm specific where you can't really pinpoint exact times that you would expect problems with E. coli. It's very much dependent on the the ecological landscape of the farm itself, like what E. coli are there. And then, you know, because of their long lifespan, just the variety of potential stressors that they might get throughout that, that lifespan, right? So I think you take that and, and you say, if I'm going to use this information to mitigate, um, I, I would do it differently depending on the bird type that I'm studying, right? So for for broiler production, um, you know, early and often vaccination might be the best approach. Um, that could also be true in, in meat turkeys, but but with meat turkeys, I mean, that's a case where I, I truly think like custom designed probiotics at, at the right time and do a lot towards helping that problem. Like if you give them probiotics at hatch and maybe at, at, at vaccination and at move, uh, th those are times when you can help competitively exclude the E. coli number one, but also help maybe boost the immune system a little bit during those times. And so, so in that case, it, it might be kind of a combination of approaches. And then, uh, you know, like the commercial vaccines have actually been the most effective to my knowledge in laying hens. Um, so, so in that case, it actually makes sense to, to do that, that type of vaccination regimen. Whereas maybe, maybe in, in meat birds, you, you just do things a little differently and you look at certain combinations of products that might be most effective. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. Um, so have you, have you done a lot of work with working with producers to get a vaccine strain that would be specific to their problem? Like how do you, how do you work with producers to do that? Yeah, we've, we've had a variety of questions that, that come up from the producers and I, I just really enjoy working with them because it, it, you know, we talked about that have an impact short term impact on, on things. And it's fun when they come because they've got a burning fire that they need to put out usually. Right. And, and so, <laughs> so it's, it's fun to see if, well, can I help in any way? And if I can, that's great. But uh, some of the questions that commonly come are uh, one, probably the most common one would be we've, we've had this elevated mortality that's been going on for a period of time in our flocks. Uh, we know what we've got. It's an E. coli. We can't figure out how to get rid of it. We don't know if if uh, if all of the cases we're seeing are, are linked to a single strain or not. And, and if so, is that the strain that we should use to try to vaccinate it out, right? And so that's a common one where, where they'll send strains and we'll look at, uh, we've got a PCR that looks at uh, just a kind of a quick snapshot of how, is it one of the nasty ones or not, right? Oh, yeah. And then beyond that, we would do genome sequencing just to understand, like, are these these strains clonally related to one another? Meaning if I collect strains from 10 different barns or farm complexes and look at them, are they are they the same strain or different, right? That's So that's one. Uh, another question that's come up a lot, too, is um, with, with salmonella, oftentimes the questions come up, does two, twofold. One is... Uh, would my would the vaccine I'm using be likely to protect against the salmonella I'm seeing? Right. So, so that again is a is a genomics based question that we can look at. But then there's always questions about the persistence of live attenuated vaccines. This seems to be a hot topic right now. Um, you know, you know what the commercial salmonella vaccines are out there, but uh, there it, it it's not unique to necessarily any one of them, but. Um, there's always a concern that maybe those strains persist a little bit longer than they might be designed to do. And that could have been a problem if, uh, when, when it comes to regulatory sampling downstream and the positives could be coming up that are actually potentially vaccine strain. So we've done a fair amount of just asking the question, uh, are some of the strains I'm seeing from my uh, meat samples all the way through the processing plant or even 
at uh, slaughter or some of those samples and those salmonella, uh, the same or different from the vaccine strain that we've been using. That's, that's important to answer. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, that, that was a really interesting one. And that that's one that's come up multiple times from a lot of different people. And it's come up, it's not just, I, I'm not worried about sharing it because it's come up in regulatory meetings as well, um, where even FSIS is using techniques to tell companies if a strain is vaccine derived or not. Right. So. Yes. Yeah. It makes sense because that, that changes the action plan, right? Right. Absolutely. Yes. Um, are there any other bacteria that you've been working on lately that are worthwhile to mention? <laughs> yeah. Well, a couple that I'm excited about to some extent is uh, one is um, we've, we've started looking at uh, Streptococcus gallolyticus, which is a gram positive bacteria uh, not all that unrelated to like the strep that causes strep throat, right? Um, but but it's a it's a bacteria that has been around forever. But but recently the the turkey producers have noticed increased numbers of cases of of, of disease, mostly septicemia, due to this bacteria. But the the dangerous thing is that it can it can just like some strep in humans can it, it likes the heart as well too, right? So it can find its way to heart tissue and, and do really well there for, for quite quite a lot of reasons, we think. But when you look at the history of research on that bacteria, um, from a there's been a lot of recovery of it and, and some, some pretty simple characterization of it, but nobody's ever really looked at the ecology of it, the, the genomics of it, trying to understand are there certain strains out there that are worse than others, and if so, what is it that's making them worse? And so I'm excited that we we got a project this year to, to start working with uh, several of the turkey veterinarians on on, uh, on, for, on as a start, just looking at what do these strains look like genomically? Um, do we see differences uh, from a virulence perspective? And, and so Dr. Billy Hargis at Arkansas has been working on this and, and we're collaborating with him on, on kind of he's developing a, a nice model for this. And, and so I think that, that that'll be very interesting just to see if uh, I kind of look at this strep similar to E. coli, where most times it's a commensal, but then if it's the right strain and the right host, it seems like there are definitely some, some strains that just will take over very quickly, right. And cause a, a lot of problems. Um, we're also getting interested in Enterococcus, uh, not, but not just Enterococcus sequorum, because I know everybody tends to think about that in, in broilers, right? But, but these other species like uh, Facium and Fecalis, that that they're very difficult to get rid of. Number one, from like hatcheries, for example, and there's some evidence that they may have an impact on the hatchability of the the birds coming out of the eggs, um, but also could can cause, in some cases, disease in young birds as well. And so that, that, again, is one that just hasn't been looked at. So I always like these examples of things that are, for lack of a better word, emergent or just maybe problems at the moment, but, but trying to understand, well, what is it about them that has made them now a, a problem or maybe they weren't so much of a problem in the past? Yes, that, that's definitely <laughs> definitely relevant and interesting. Especially in talking about sustainability and production, and what what else can be done as far as controlling anything that could be pathogenic to the bird or human or both. <laughs> right, right. It's like these we do good things in poultry, I think, but there's always an ancillary effect of some sort, right? So reducing use of antibiotics, alternative products, but but um, there's always a new problem that arises, and those are sometimes the most interesting ones. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Definitely. Um, is there is there anything else uh, about your work that you're burning to share that we haven't chatted about already? No, I think we've done a really good job of covering the main <laughs> stuff I spend my time on. I have a burning question. Have you ever uh, accidentally inoculated yourself and experienced <laughs> the diseases you study? <laughs> yeah, you know, I am. I am very lucky and happy to say I have not made myself sick. <laughs> that I know, nice, and and I will, and nobody in my lab has either. But I, I will say I've experienced firsthand that what happens when 
when that accident does happen. Um, so we had an issue, a, a salmonella issue with an, with another group a few years back, and I'll, I'll just say that there were departments of health involved. There were there were many different agencies involved. So aseptic technique and protecting yourself as a lab worker <laughs> should be number yeah. one priority for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, good. I, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say, am I colonized with any of the E. coli that I've ever worked with? Uh, possibly. I hope not. So, yes. Heck, maybe maybe you could just stir yourself in as an extra sample someday to see. <laughs> in grad school, we did that one time. We we all sampled ourselves to see if anybody was carrying the lab strains, and none of them did. So that was good. <laughs> nice. Excellent. Just just proving uh, proving your worth as a scientist for your aseptic technique. I love that. <laughs> so we we usually wrap up our podcast asking everybody uh, same three questions. So I'll I'll wrap up our podcast here doing the same. Um, what what's your favorite poultry or agriculture resource? Yeah, this is going to sound very boring, but um, the diseases of poultry is the one that sits on my desk every day. So I use that that more than anything, especially when it's these emerging diseases, it's like, well, what is, what is a Streptococcus gallolyticus? And you can look it up and, and, and there's just about anything and everything on poultry disease in that book. Um, so that's, that's kind of my go-to. Yeah. I'm a books person. I love having the hard copy on my desk. I have a hard time reading PDFs. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't like the PDFs either. It's nicer to just be able to open it and and look at it. Yes. Um, what What's your uh, favorite non-poultry book or resource? Yeah. So I'll give you a, a science related one and then a non-science. So this, so we've, we've used this book in one of our classes. It's called Poisoned by Jeff Benedict. And it walks through the Jack in the Box O E. coli 0157 outbreak. And so it's not directly related to my work, but it, it does it from the human and the lawyer perspective. And I just think it's a fascinating book if you want to learn about what goes on behind the scenes when there's these kind of outbreaks. Uh, it's just really an interesting book. And then I'm a I'm kind of an American history buff, so I read a lot of uh, of the I've tried to I probably read most of the the books that are out there on the different characters that played roles in the Revolutionary War. Um, there's a there's a really good one on uh, John Adams. I think it might even be just titled John Adams, but Oh That's yeah, one that I read recently, and that was good. Um, but yeah, historical stuff I like that. So I yeah, I, I like historical not like historical nonfiction is so interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. For uh, for someone that is looking to be successful in the poultry industry, what's your best advice? Yeah, I've been asked this question before, and I, I still will stick with the answer I've used, which it's again, it's it sounds boring, but I. For me, I can't emphasize enough to our students as they're graduating and deciding what direction they might go. And a lot of times it's poultry or industry work. It's the importance of, of continuing to make connections all the time and, and, and also maintain those connections. Uh, and that can be done at, I mean, meetings are the most obvious place, but a lot of times it's, it's in the most unexpected places. Like I the other day, I live in Spicer, Minnesota, and um, Genio and Select Genetics are headquartered close to here. And I ran into somebody at a school sports function that I had no idea who this person was and came to find out that they're a pretty big player on the food safety side at Genio Turkey, right? And I probably never would have met them otherwise. And, and so, I mean, I think anytime you can talk about yourself, not not sounding like a narcissist or anything, but you can talk with people about your life and, and tell them, and you, you'd be surprised at how many people you might meet and, and just form connections with that are either directly uh, positive towards your career or, or even indirectly positive, right? So that, that's one thing. And then um, I think the other thing is continuing education. So uh, even especially for the early career people, even if you, you you think I got my bachelor's or I've got my master's, I'm good to go. I'm going to work my way up the corporate ladder. Um, think about things that, and often, and most times the companies themselves will support this, right? They'll, they'll be, if you express an interest, 
and you show the motivation, they'll be supportive of helping you. Maybe you want to get some business background or maybe leadership skills, right? Um, I think there's lots of opportunities out there. And and a lot of times, I think those HR people are just looking for the people with motivation and with that that mentality. And if, if you can express that to them, then they're going to remember that. Yeah. Oh, I, I think that is definitely good advice, especially the networking. You know, nothing motivates people like a common interest or a common enemy, should I say, if your uh, kids are on the same team. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're sitting there for three hours and you've got to shoot the crap anyways, right? So you might as well talk yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This is a it, really interesting topic to me, um, just because the landscape is always changing. And it sounds like you're harnessing some amazing technology that will help us really understand what's going on and hopefully be predictive. Hopefully. <laughs> I love That's that. That's the plan. But thanks for uh, inviting me. And then and I've really enjoyed listening to these podcasts. So it's fun to be a, a part of it. So. Oh, yeah, you're welcome.